It is good to be with you again this morning. I hope you are all doing well. Uh, this is now the second week of our pause, going back to studying together exclusively online and on the telephone. As most of you know, we are continuing with something of a spike in COVID-19 cases here in Madison and in Dane County. And we still have a number in the congregation who are not doing well. Uh, due to this video being somewhat public, I've tried to respect privacy by not mentioning people by name. I would love to do that, but I want to honor uh, your wishes as well. But God knows. All of our members have a church directory, so I do hope that we're checking in on each other as we should. Uh, since we're not meeting in person today, we'd like to encourage everybody to sing and to pray and to give and to partake of the Lord's Supper. In addition to studying the Word together, all of these things are things that we can do on our own or with our families or with a small group of friends. As you know, we've posted some good recipes for the unleavened bread over the past several months. We have links and an address for giving both on the website and in the, in the bulletin. And if you have something that we need to be praying about as a congregation or as an eldership privately, we hope that you'll get in touch either by call or by text or by email. The church number is 608-224-0274. And our email address is fourlakeschurch at gmail.com. I hope you'll get in touch if there's any way that we can serve you. It's a little bit strange to me that we already have new traditions this year. Uh, but as our custom has been over the past several months, we're starting this morning with God's plan for our salvation. He sent his son as a sacrifice to die in our place. And we appreciate that. We are deeply thankful for that. And so we respond as he has instructed by believing the message by turning away from sin, by confessing Jesus as the Son of God, and then by allowing ourselves to be buried with Jesus in the act of baptism, allowing ourselves to be immersed in water for the forgiveness of our sins. And at that point, the Christian life begins and we live for Him. And once again, we have some examples this morning by way of encouragement. And we start today with a report by Ricky Gudum. He's in India. And he baptized Ramish this past Lord's Day morning, one week ago. Ramish has been attending worship with the congregation there in India for several years, along with his family. But now Ramish has become a Christian, and we're certainly thankful for that. Ricky says that Ramish is a bank manager in Allahabad, India. But we rejoice with Ramish and his new Christian family this morning. Uh, then we have another update from Alfred Bayan, and we've included a number of updates from him over the past couple months. Alfred is a gospel preacher in Liberia in the, on the continent of Africa, and he reports a number of baptisms this week. He says that over the past one and a half months that they've been studying with a denominational church known as the Life of Christ Church. And last Sunday, they did the first baptisms in that group, transforming that man-made religious group into a congregation of the Lord's people. And this Sunday will be their first meeting together as the Lord's Church in Lower Johnsonville, Liberia. That is some amazing news. I had to edit this down. There were so many baptisms in this group this past week. I just simply could not include them all. The next picture here, is of two of those groups that have recently been baptized. Again, they couldn't fit them all in one picture. This is the same denominational group that, uh, that was baptized, basically. I think we'd explain it in that way. And uh, that is just some amazing news, to say the least, to see an entire group turn toward the simplicity of simple, pure New Testament Christianity. And again, uh, we share all of this by way of encouragement. What these people have done over the past week, you can do this morning. If you have any questions, if there's any way we can help, if we can study together, uh, we would absolutely love to hear from you. Most of us appreciate hearing some good news from time to time. We love seeing good people do well. It makes us feel good when a nice person recovers from a terrible illness. We love seeing that happen. Uh, we like seeing good behavior rewarded. And yet at the same time, we also realize that this is not always the way things work. In fact, many times those who are evil are the ones who seem to win in the end in this life. Somebody sideswipes your car in the parking lot and they get away with it, never to be seen again, never being held accountable for what they've done. Or maybe the little guy gets crushed by lawyers, by a huge corporation. He can't fight back, and, and it's the, the people with the money who win, perhaps, in that situation. 
Or maybe I fill up at the gas station and, and somebody swipes my debit card number and, and they seem to get away with it and that money's gone and they've taken that money, they've done whatever with it and they're never held accountable for that. They're rewarded for evil behavior. This morning then, for the next two Sundays, I want us to study a psalm that I've been thinking about for a number of months now. And it basically gives some advice and encouragement concerning how we as God's people need to respond when the bad guys win. And that happens so often today, doesn't it? As most of us know by now, life is not fair, is it? Life is not fair. Those who are unqualified might get promoted. Terrible human beings get elected over and over again. Those who lie and cheat and steal seem to get away with it. And here we are as God's people doing the best that we can, going to work every day, being honest, being good. And we're the ones who seem to be getting sick and ripped off and ignored or whatever. And so the question is, how do we respond to this? What do we do? What do we need to be thinking when the bad guys win? The psalm that we're going to consider this morning is Psalm number 37. It was written by King David. As we'll discover next week in the passage that we plan on covering a week from now, David is an old man when he writes this psalm. And as an old man, David has seen some things, haven't he? Hasn't he? Of all people, David is someone who knows that life is not fair that life does not always seem to reward the righteous. As a teenager, we think about David being overlooked by his own father. Remember that? Samuel came to anoint a new king, and everybody was brought out by the father except for David. No way it could be David. Of course, it was David. And so he was overlooked by his own father, wasn't he? He was looked down upon by his own brothers. And then, even after he's anointed as the future king, he spends most of his 20s on the run for his life from King Saul. Years later, as he's firmly entrenched as king, at least he thinks that, that he is, he's run out of town by his son Absalom. His own wife turns against him. And yet through all of it, David keeps the faith. He's not perfect by any means, but he's faithful. And now as an older man, King David writes a song. Before we get into it, I want to point out that Psalm 37 is something of an acrostic. That's a term that we've used before. It seems to be arranged around the letters of the Hebrew alphabet, where roughly every other verse starts with the next consecutive letter in the Hebrew alphabet. And so as you can imagine, this probably makes this psalm a bit easier to memorize, in Hebrew anyway, not in English. It doesn't really come through for us in English. But as you can also probably imagine, this makes Psalm 37 a bit difficult to organize. So it's easier to memorize, a lot more difficult to organize. In fact, Psalm 37 seems to have more in common with the Proverbs than it does with the rest of the psalm. It's almost what to do when bad guys win arranged in alphabetical order. And the order in many senses doesn't make sense. Due to the arrangement, the subject matter is a little bit jumbled. This morning, though, we'll be looking at a series of commands to obey. We'll see this in verses 1 through 11. Next week, we'll look at David's advice to take the long view of life in verses 12 through 26. And then the week after that, we hope to end with his reminder that actions do have consequences. And we find that in verses 27 through 40. Today, though, let's look at a series of commands to obey. We see this in verses 1 through 11. So this morning, let's look at Psalm 37, 1 through 11, the words of King David. Psalm 37, 1 through 11. Do not fret because of evildoers. Be not envious toward wrongdoers. For they will wither quickly like the grass and fade like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and cultivate faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him, and he will do it. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your judgment as the noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who carries out wicked schemes. 
Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret. It leads only to evil doing. For evildoers will be cut off. But those who wait for the Lord, they will inherit the land. Yet a little while, and the wicked man will be no more. And you will look carefully for his place, and he will not be there. But the humble will inherit the land, and will delight themselves in abundant prosperity. Again, as we think about how unfair things can be in this world sometimes, let's look for some commands to obey in these first 11 verses. And we start right away in verse 1, as King David gives a very clear command, doesn't he? Do not fret because of evildoers. As I studied this week, I suddenly realized that fret is not a word that I use too often or ever. I don't know if I've ever used the word fret in a normal conversation. I'm not a guitar player. I think fret is a term that's known to those who play the guitar. It's not a term that, that's really familiar to me. I think I can figure it out based on the context, based on what I know about that word. I'm just saying it's not a word that I often use. But I looked it up in some other translations to try to get a, a clearer picture of what this word means in this context. I found it interesting that the King James Version, translated in 1611, has David saying, Fret not thyself because of evildoers. And again, never in my life have I ever told someone to fret not thyself. Maybe I need to add that to my uh, repertoire of things that I say. Uh, but again, never in my life have I said that. I might need to start saying that more often. Uh, other translations say, don't worry about the wicked. That's a lot easier for me to understand. That's the New Living Translation. Or uh, do not be agitated by evildoers. That's the Christian Standard Bible. Or burn not with vexation because of evildoers. Again, that's not a phrase that I use very often these days either. But uh, surprisingly, most modern translations continue to use the word fret. And I find that interesting because, again, it's not a word that most of us use on a regular basis. Well, we look up the word fret, and it basically refers to being frustrated. And it goes back to a word referring to getting overheated or flaring up. And I think about getting overheated and my experience in that area. I think of a trip our family took to Tennessee when I was a little kid. And on the trip from Nashville over to Memphis to attend a series of lectures at the Getwell Congregation in Memphis, our 1979 Plymouth Volari overheated. That was a very dramatic moment for me. I don't know how old I was, maybe seven or eight years old, something like that. But something went wrong with the radiator. Well, my dad had heard and he understood that you can turn the heat on full blast in the car to help dissipate some of that heat away from the engine and into the passenger compartment. Well, that was a memorable trip to be traveling in Tennessee with the heat on full blast on a warm fall day. I remember uh, my mom's lipstick completely uh, melting in her purse, just totally liquefied. That's how hot it was in that car. Well, we made it to Memphis, but instead of the engine overheating, we were the ones who overheated on that day. Well, that's the word King David uses here. Do not fret. Do not get overheated by evildoers. Don't get frustrated. Don't get overly annoyed by the success of evil people. Don't fret when the bad guys seem to win. It's hard not to fret or get overheated or, or burned up under these circumstances. But let's remember, this is some advi inspired advice from an old man, King David. David has seen the bad guys win from time to time, hasn't he? But he also knows that those victories are very temporary. And we'll see that over and over and over again in this chapter. When the bad guys win, it is a temporary situation. So that's what he warns about here. As far as God's people are concerned, don't fret. Don't get overheated by that because of evildoers. I think if we're paying attention to what's going on in the world right now, I think all of us have some pretty good reasons to fret, don't we? All of us have some things that we're concerned about. But King David here, he tells us, not to fret. We're not to be overcome with worry and concern when we see evil people doing well. In fact, we have this command three times in these opening verses, don't we, in this first paragraph. Do not fret, do not fret, 
do not fret. This is a command from God through King David, a command to be obeyed. As we just studied a week or two ago, we might not be able to stop certain thoughts from entering our minds, but when they do, instead of worrying about these things, can't we choose to pray about those concerns? I can't ignore world events. I can't ignore all of the things that are going on in this country right now. I can't ignore things that are happening right here in Madison. I can't make those thoughts leave my mind completely. But when they come to mind, can't I take those concerns to God in prayer? And so instead of fretting about politics or the virus or the economy, since we're already thinking about those things, let's turn those concerns into prayers. As we go back to the text, let's continue noticing a second command to be obeyed, that we are not to be envious toward wrongdoers. As I understand it, envy is a strong feeling of resentment, but it seems to include a feeling of jealousy combined with evil motives. In other words, I want what that other person has. But not only do I want it, I would consider doing something evil to either get it myself or take it away from them. And so when I see an evil person prosper and do well, and I'm over here doing right and, and suffering, I might be tempted to start wanting what he has, even to the point of, of switching sides or, or wishing that I could. It's a sin based on making a comparison. And so instead of being content, I see what somebody else has, and I'm no longer thankful for how God's blessed me. But I am now discontent with what I have, and I want what they have, and I might very well do something to get it. Notice, though, as David moves from verse 1 to verse 2, he gives a reason for not going down this road, doesn't he? And the reason seems to go back to something he learned early in life as a shepherd. He says, Be not envious toward wrongdoers, for they will wither quickly like the grass and fade like the green herb. He pictures envy then as longing for grass. It looks good at the moment, but it's so temporary. In the same way, when the evil prosper, their prosperity is incredibly brief. And it really makes no sense to envy what they have. It doesn't make sense to get burned up over what they have and we don't. And we'll get back to this next week with the idea of taking the long view. But for now, we've got the command. Do not be envious toward wrongdoers. Don't waste your time wishing you had something that will wither and fade almost immediately. As we go back to the text, we have a third command to be obeyed in verse 3. As we're told simply to trust in the Lord. As I understand it, trust is the idea of leaning confidently on someone or something for support. I want to talk more about this in the future if I can, but on my recent trip out to see my sister, I learned something about the value of trekking poles while hiking. I had some serious hikes planned, some places I'd never gone before beyond my skill level, at least as far as I was concerned. And I was talking to my sister about that, and, and my sister said that if I did this one particular hike, she said, you will need trekking poles do not do this hike without them. Well, I've always been a fan of what I refer to as my uh, Moses stick. And I've got it right here. I don't know if you're going to be able to see this. Uh, but this is basically my son's old bow staff from karate. Bow staff that you use in fighting and, and karate. And, and so I, when he moved on from that, I, uh, I inherited this. And I, I took a plane and I planed it down on two sides so it fits in my hand well. And I sharpened the other end of it so I can jab it in the ground and it keeps me up. And then on the other end, I put a little uh, ball, kind of universal ball thing here for a camera mount to go on. So it's kind of a monopod that I can jam in the ground or whatever. And I've used this for many years. If you've gone to camp with us, you've seen me use this on hikes. And it's been good to me in the past. I love my Moses stick. And so I told my sister, well, I've got my Moses stick. And she said, no, 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 that will not do it. If you don't want to die, she said, you need trekking poles. Okay, well, that sounds kind of serious. And so I shopped around, looked online. I ended up going with some highly rated trekking poles at, at Walmart. And I did that in case I uh, needed to return them. I, I guess I didn't have full faith that this was a real thing. And so I thought, I'm not going to mail them back to Amazon. I'm just going to get them at Walmart and I can take them back if I, if I really don't like it. 
Well, on my first real hike in the mountains on that last trip, these are the trekking. This is one of them, got a little cork up here. I put another camera mount here, and on this end they expand and they can go up and down and got a little metal end to jab, jab the ground and all that. On the first real hike in the mountains on this lap, last trip, these $20 trekking poles literally saved my life at least half a dozen times and several more times on other hikes out there after that. Uh, there were trails where you could look off over the cliff and not see the bottom. And this was right there inches from where, where your feet were going. And there were several times when those $20 poles caught me as I was falling, as I was slipping on rocks and gravel and mud and, and crossing streams and so on. And as the miles added up, those poles very quickly earned my trust. I learned to lean on them for support. And that's what David is suggesting here. Not just suggesting, he is commanding it, isn't he, in verse 3. He's demanding that we trust in the Lord, lean on him for support. The word seems to be the Old Testament equivalent of faith in the New Testament. And it's found more than a hundred times in the Hebrew Bible. Well, the alternative to trusting God, of course, is putting our trust in people, putting our trust in politicians, putting our trust in government, putting our trust in science. How's that working out for us? It often leads to disappointment, doesn't it, when we put our trust in mere human beings. People let us down, don't they? Some people are more trustworthy than others, of course, but others prove themselves to be unworthy of our trust over time. But we also know that there's great comfort in finding somebody we can trust. I compare it to trusting the driver on a long car trip. A long car trip is a lot more pleasant if we trust the person who's driving, isn't it? If we don't trust the person who's driving, that's not going to be a good trip. Some of you know that years ago, my wife and I drove together to see her sister out in Fort Collins, Colorado. And after driving west through Nebraska, I told my wife, I cannot do Nebraska again. I can't do Nebraska again. It's, it's too big. It's too boring. I can't do that again. I cannot be conscious driving through Nebraska. And, and I told her, the next time we drive through that state on the way home, I need to be unconscious. Can I please be unconscious? You need to do this. And she agreed, and on the way home, on the Wyoming border, she took over. <laughs> and thankfully, I knew that I could trust her as a driver. Thankfully, I fell asleep rather quickly, and I was spared the experience of being awake again through the state of Nebraska. But the point here is, I could trust her as a driver. Now imagine if I couldn't. Without that trust, that, that trip would have been miserable. Worrying through every turn, every stop, every lane change, and so on, that would be a horrible experience. With God, though, like a good driver, we feel secure. We can lean on him for support. We have confidence that unlike human people, he will not let us down. And so even when the bad guys seem to win, even when life seems to fall apart all around us, this psalm suggests that we can lean on God for support. He can handle the weight that we throw in his direction. We trust him for that reason. As we go back to the text, we have a fourth command in verse 3. As we're told to do good. And I find it interesting that these two seem to be pretty closely tied together, don't they? Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and cultivate faithfulness. When we trust in the Lord, that trust allows us to continue doing good despite our circumstances. Despite looking around us and seeing those who are evil do well in this life. In other words, I don't focus on what they're doing. But I need to refocus on what I need to be doing. Instead of reacting with worry and despair with what's going on in the world around us, we get to work. We do good, as David says here. We show the world how it's done. We show the world what true happiness is. And that true happiness is not found in a party on Langdon Street. But instead, true joy is found in doing good and doing what's right. Obviously, there's quite a bit of turmoil in the world around us tied to the election. And to be so easy to get sucked into that, isn't it? It's so easy to get overwhelmed with that no matter what side you're on. But I'm thinking at this point, I can't really fix this problem. This is not my issue, but you know what I can do? I can go out and I can get some more brownie mix for the kids at Schultz-Lewis. I can handle that. I can do good. 
In fact, I think I need to go back to Aldi this afternoon and, and buy some cookie mix for the kids and just keep on buying cookie and brownie mix until I feel better about what's going on in the world right now. Think that might work? And so when we get back to worshiping in the building, if you cannot get in the building because the entire building is packed with brownie mix, um, that might have been me. <laughs> if that's the way we want to handle what's going on right now. I might be exaggerating, but I think that seems to be what David is saying here. When bad guys do well, when things don't turn out like we expect, when evil people succeed in life and make money and, and do better than we do from an earthly point of view, don't get worried about that. Don't fret. But instead, just do good. We dwell in the land. We cultivate faithfulness. We do what God's people always do, according to Hebrews 13, 16. Do not neglect doing good and sharing. For with such sacrifices, God is pleased. You can't go wrong by doing good and sharing. We don't let somebody else's evil distract us from doing what's good. In fact, the more good we do the less chance evil has of ultimately succeeding, right? And by that I mean the more good we do, the less time we have to fret, the less time we have to be envious in these other things that he's telling us not to do. Doing good has a way of keeping us out of trouble ourselves. And so we're on safe ground here if we follow this command to do good. As we go back to Psalm 37, notice we find in verse 4 that we're also to delight in the Lord. This doesn't mean that we just need to fake a smile when we come together for worship, but it means that the Lord himself is our greatest delight. The word itself refers to something that is soft, delicate, or dainty. And I looked up that definition, I'm like, that's just something that doesn't seem right. I don't know about you, but I don't think about King David in those terms, uh, soft, delicate, dainty. I don't even think about him having those feelings about anything. But it's the idea that God himself is our greatest delight. We delight in him. And so we take great pleasure in studying his word, in coming to him in prayer, in singing songs of praise together. We love the Lord more than absolutely anything. We delight ourselves in the Lord. He is our everything. Sometimes we sing the song, His Yoke is Easy. That's a song I like to lead sometimes on Wednesday nights. I found my Lord and he is mine. He won me by his love. I'll serve him all my years of time and dwell with him above. His yoke is easy. His burden is light. I found it so. I found it so. His service is my sweetest delight. His blessings ever flow. His service is our sweetest delight. That's what King David is suggesting here. We might imagine a little kid opening up a birthday present. And as that wrapping paper comes off, those eyes get huge. This is the best thing ever. In the same way, our relationship with God is absolutely everything to us. Our relationship with God is more important than the relationship we have with our spouse, with our children, with our job, with the nation that we live in, with anybody or anything else. And so in a world where bad guys often win, the Lord comes first. When terrible things happen, we turn our eyes back to Jesus. When we constantly look at the problem, evil seems almost overwhelming, doesn't it? There are a lot of evil things going on in the world right now. If we want to focus on that, that could absolutely overwhelm our minds. And so we have the reminder here instead, we are to delight in the Lord. Don't focus on the evil. Look to the Lord. Turn to him. And then when we want what he wants, God says he will give us the desires of our heart. Somebody suggested that Psalm 37, 4 is the Matthew 6, 33 of the New Testament. Or of the Old Testament, we should say. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. That's the Old Testament version of Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, right here in verse 4 of Psalm 37. We are to delight in the Lord. As we go back to the text, notice we find in verse 7, also in verses 9 through 11, that we are to rest and to wait. In this context, rest is to be quiet, to be still. And I know it's hard for us to be quiet these days. A lot of people have a hard time with silence. It's hard to be in a quiet room by ourselves for a while, at least for some people. And so we'll often distract ourselves, won't we? 
We'll go online, we'll look things up, we'll distract ourselves maybe with music in the background or, or movies, just constant activity. But there's a value to resting in the Lord and being quiet with Him and just waiting patiently for Him. There's a value in spending time alone with God without always saying something. We don't always have to be saying something in prayer to the Lord. It's okay to be there in silence with God. That doesn't mean we're lazy. But resting in the Lord and waiting patiently are commanded here. This is an order from headquarters, as my grandmother used to say. In faith, instead of fretting, instead of lashing out in anger when the bad guys win all around us, sometimes we need to simply be quiet and wait. It's the opposite of panic, isn't it? As God's people, generally, we are not the panicking type. I don't share this to brag at all, but speaking of not panicking, one of our election officials down at Chavez uh, is a retired accountant, and uh, she and her husband have worked two elections now with me so far down there. And so she's a retired accountant and auditor in the Madison area. And a couple days ago, she sent a letter to the city clerk and uh, sent the copy to me as well. And among other things, this is what she said. She said, Baxter's cool, calm demeanor as the chief inspector was an example set and followed by the rest of us. And when I opened that email, I think I laughed out loud when I, when I read that. Because, you know, and I share this in part to confess that I was not always feeling very calm, cool, and collected on the inside this past Tuesday in the rush of it. Uh, it was a long day, as I explained this past Wednesday. But I, I share this to illustrate that as God's people... We're not the ones who usually panic too easily, do we? And I think the reason is we know that we're part of a much larger plan. And so we go through our work day. We handle the things that are thrown at us. We do our part. And we might have a thousand challenges coming at us from all different directions. But you know what? On another level, we also know that God has a way of taking care of things. And so our trust is in Him. And so the command here is that we rest and we wait. As we go back to the text, we have another command in verse 8. <clears throat> We're told to cease from anger. Cease from anger and forsake wrath, King David says. The word anger in this passage gets back to a word referring to nostrils. Okay, that's a little weird, isn't it? That's really weird. Until we realize what happens when we get really, really mad. Our nostrils flare our anger changes the way we look and behave. People can look at us, they can, they can tell we're mad. We huff, we puff, we snort. I don't snort, I don't know, maybe people snort when they're angry. But we look at somebody and, and we can often tell by looking at their face how mad they are. Veins bulging in the, in the neck and the forehead and all that. And that seems to be what's going on here. Not that we can never be angry about anything. That's not what this passage is teaching. But when the bad guys win, as they often will in this life, we can't be getting burned up about it. We can't live in a constant state of rage in this life. When the bad guys win, we can't be going around constantly clenching our teeth and huffing and puffing with the veins bulging and all that. Why not? Well, as with fretting, as we discussed earlier, it leads only to evil doing, doesn't it? Nothing good comes from living in a constant state of anger and rage. It's not good for us neither physically nor spiritually. Either way, constant anger is dangerous. And so we're told in this passage to cease from anger. To cease is to relax, to let go, to let the Lord handle it. Or as Paul says in Romans 12, 21, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Responding to anger and wrath usually doesn't help a situation if we respond to anger and wrath with more anger and wrath of our own. That doesn't solve it. And here the warning is that it might actually lead to evil doing. That's what King David says. But as God's people, we're different. And so we are to cease from anger. If I need to turn the news off for a few days, then I need to turn the news off for a few days. If that's what it takes to not be angry all the time, then that's what I need to do. But here David says we are to cease from anger and wrath. As we come to the end of our study this morning, I'm thankful for the reminder. When good things seem to happen to bad people, when the bad guys win, we have scripture to handle that, don't we? We have inspired advice. As Israel's king for most of his life, King David absolutely saw some terrible, terrible things. 
but he also saw good things happen to bad people. And when the same thing continues to happen today, we have these commands from King David, from God, ultimately. And this isn't just a one-time thing, but from here on out, we can always come back here for the reminder. Whether it's today or 20 years from now, whenever we find ourselves frustrated by what's going on in the world, reading Psalm 37 should be an encouragement to us. And the psalm starts in verses 1 through 11, as we've studied this morning, with a series of very simple commands. I hope you can join us next week as we continue looking at some good words from King David in Psalm number 37. As we close this morning, let's go to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, you are the great and awesome God, creator of heaven and earth. You are the King of kings and Lord of lords. We're thankful for the opportunity and the great privilege in studying your word this morning. We continue to ask your blessing on our members who are suffering with the virus, and we also ask for your continued blessing on those who work in health care, that you would keep them safe and give them the strength they need to carry on in some very difficult circumstances. Be with our members who are in the process of recovering. We pray that they would continue getting stronger with your help. This morning, we also ask a special blessing on our nation. As you have instructed, we continue to pray for kings and for all who are in positions of authority so that we as your people might lead tranquil and quiet lives in all godliness and dignity. This is our prayer. Thank you, Father, for those who have obeyed the gospel over the past several days all around the world. We pray that the borders of your kingdom would continue to expand and that the saving power of your gospel would continue reaching out to every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You are truly worthy of all praise. We come to you this morning in the name of Jesus, your Son, our Savior, and our King. Lord, come quickly. Amen.